Well, hey, it's Dr. J. Today we're going to learn about optimization. Uh, optimal is an adjective, and it means the best or most favorable. So we seek the optimal solution. problem. Um, now a problem of course is probably given by a, an equation um, uh, in an application and of course in, uh, in a calculus application. So um, without any further ado we'll go ahead and get started. Um, in business we typically seek to maximize profit revenue sales Etc. Etc. So things of that nature, we seek a maximal or the maximum value that we can possibly get. That's that's what we would consider the best or the most favorable outcome. Um, or to minimize cost. Um, what else? Uh, energy, maybe. Time, et cetera, et cetera. So certain quantities in mathematics, especially in the applications in business, we seek to maximize them. Um, and in other areas, um, we seek to minimize them, depending on what it is. And so that's what we would consider the most favorable outcome. Um, I will begin with an example from physics which is a classic calculus problem called the pumpkin chuck um, this became famous in the 1980s um, it's based on a contest from the 1980s. Uh, started in the 1980s. It actually still exists to this very day. I just Googled it to, to uh, out of curiosity to see if the contest is still going on um, in Oklahoma. So some university students um, in Oklahoma started this contest in the 1980s where they were seeking the optimal solution to, a, to the problem. Um, now the problem was sort of an entertaining problem of chucking a pumpkin, and they called this the great pumpkin chunk. Chunk. This is how they spell it. The pumpkin chuck or the pumpkin chunk. And um, students from the university would build a device, um, like a cannon, yeah, and they would, and of course each team builds the device to launch the pumpkin. Um, it could be like a cannon or like a, a catapult or, or some sort of device for, you know, like a, some, some um, look like crossbows, like giant crossbows. Um, so whatever, I'm drawing mine to kind of look like a cannon or a tube. And they would, the goal was to launch this pumpkin. There's my pumpkin. Out of this cannon-like device as far as they possibly could. And whichever pumpkin went the farthest would win. 
All right, so um, they would measure the distance. Yeah, and then a prize was given. Um, actually, prize is given for longest distance. And they call it pumpkin chunking, um, obviously, because uh, when the um, pumpkin would get chucked, it would then break into chunks. And so that's where it got the name pumpkin chunk. Um, so this problem became very famous. It was so famous that even in a little town in California, uh, we heard about it on the national news. Um, and then it be got picked up by all the other news channels. And every year, you, typically in October, um, you know, around Halloween, they would um, advertise and, and broadcast the results and announce the winners and which pumpkin made it the longest distance. So what does this have to do with calculus? Well, after um, a few years, this activity made its way into many calculus textbooks. Um, it's not in our calculus textbook, but it is in the calculus textbook that I learned um, calculus from in the 1990s, or at least one of the calculus textbooks that I learned. And so here is the calculus example. And the way we like to do it um, is a little bit more exciting. Instead of measuring the horizontal distance, we're going to measure the height. And because this is a calculus question, we're going to optimize it and we want to find the maximum height that the pumpkin will attain. And then to make the game a little bit more exciting, because just launching a pumpkin and, and watching it explode onto the flat ground of, of the Oklahoma prairie um, might be exciting for folks in Oklahoma, but um, here in California, we like to do things a little bit more exciting we like to launch them off of cliffs. So that pumpkin's gonna go bam when it hits the ground, launching it off of a cliff. And so when we measure the height, we're measuring the max height above the ground level or sometimes sea level is used. If you happen to be near the beach, uh, you can launch it off a cliff and, and into the water and maybe the pumpkin won't break into pieces as much, but who knows, maybe it will. Maybe it hits the water, you know. Anybody that's ever jumped into the water from a high uh, point realizes that um, it can hurt and, and possibly even, you know, cause things to break up. Um, so anyway, that is the calculus uh, version of the pumpkin chunk or the pumpkin chunk. All right. Um, so we are going to give a prize. Now, the prize for you is going to be you get points uh, for finding the maximum height. So suppose a pumpkin is launched from... Uh, a uh, 256-foot cliff onto the ground below, above the ground below. The height in feet is modeled by, and I'm just going to go ahead and give you the function since this is example one. Um, we're measuring in feet, so the leading coefficient is negative 16 t squared. Again, that's that comes from physics. Um, I'm not going to really, um, you know, digress too much into the formula for where that comes from, but you can just know that if you are measuring an object moving through space, whether it's a falling object or a propelled or launched object. Um, we saw that earlier in this course when we were talking about falling objects, 
um, that the leading coefficient here is negative 16 uh, when measured in feet. Uh, t squared plus 112t. Uh, that comes from the, the velocity in which it's launched off the cliff. And then the height of the cliff, 256. So this is our model. And we want to find the maximum height. I forgot to say where T is in seconds. So T measures the number of seconds um, after launch. Okay, uh, find the maximum height. That is our optimal solution, the maximum height. Uh, we don't really need the, the drawing anymore. Okay, so we start with our function. Let me just write it out one more time. Negative 16t squared plus 112t plus 256. This is a calculus course. Um, Devote this chapter has been uh, focused on derivatives, uh, finding maximums and minimums. Um, by finding the derivative and then setting the derivative equal to zero. Okay. Um, now, if the um, concavity is concave down, then this would give you a maximum. If obviously if the concavity was the other way, if it was concave up, it would find a minimum. Clearly the diagram shows a concave down behavior. So this will give us the maximum. So we'll go ahead and solve this, uh, subtract 112 and divide by negative 32. I think that's about three, maybe three and a half, 112 divided by 32. Yep, three and a half. Uh, you are going to need, you know, the, the decimal, so three and a half seconds. All right. So that's the amount of time required to reach the maximum. So the max height is h of 3.5. Remember, go back to the original function to actually calculate the height. The derivative gives you the critical value. Yeah, or the optimal time. perfect time, also known as the sweet spot. So that's where the height is at its maximum. It's at the peak of the path. So we'll plug it into here, negative 16 times 3.5 squared plus 112 times 3.5 plus 256. And let your calculator do the walking. So 3.5 squared is 12.25 times negative 16, negative 196. Uh, 3.5 times 112 is 392. All right, and then plus 256. Uh, you might notice a pattern here. 392 minus 196. I usually do those two first because I like to see the pattern. It's always half of the middle term. So be careful with the signs here. It's negative 196, but then plus 392. And this always happens. Be 
this always happens. I mean, it's not always these numbers, but this pattern always happens. If you don't notice that type of a pattern with the first two terms, then you probably did something wrong. Now, I know that I'm focusing on those first two terms, but don't forget about this last term here. So um, that's the cliff. Um, I will mention, by the way, if we were back in Oklahoma doing the pumpkin chunk and you're just doing it on flat ground, you know, in a big giant field, then there would be no 256. That would be gone. And the answer just would be 196. Right. But to make this a little more exciting, we are throwing the uh, pumpkin off of a cliff. So 196 plus the 256 foot cliff that it originally was thrown off of. So the maximum height is 452 feet. Four hundred and fifty-two feet. Again, above the ground, it's actually only one hundred and ninety-six feet above the cliff, or above the edge of the cliff. But then you have that extra two hundred and fifty-six feet that it falls to the ground when it finally goes chunk, smashing pumpkins. Okay, what a fun way to to start the uh, the season. Um, too bad it's not fall semester. Maybe it will be fall semester by the time you're watching this video. So. Um, I don't know. Well, back to business. What does this have to do with business? Well, we still seek the optimal solution, the best or most favorable solution. Uh, most of the problems that we cover in this course are business related, but we're not exclusively um, learning about that. We're also learning about nature and behavior and, and how the, the world works. And it turns out that there's an old cliche of what goes up must come down and this principle principle applies to money yeah what goes up must come down in particular uh, profit So we can use this same principle in a business application when it comes to finding profit. And as you probably can imagine, if you're in a business setting, your goal is to make the most profit you possibly can in whatever situation you're in. So suppose... A company sells uh, widgets and um, and the profit is modeled by P of X is negative point zero zero oh nope negative zero point zero got to get the number of zeros right um, so two hundredths, two, two hundredths, x squared plus 13x minus 24. Find the optimal solution. So optimize the profit. All right, so we want to optimize the profit. In other words, find the number of widgets um, that would maximize profit and then what is the maximal profit? So that's what it means to optimize, in quotes, optimize the profit. So it's a two-part solution. We want to know how many widgets need to be sold, right? And then what is the maximum profit if you sell that many widgets? Okay. 
And this is a lot like launching a pumpkin into the air. Um, now what's a little bit different about the scenario is the ground level would be up here. Yeah. Or you could also call it sea level, yeah. Because we sometimes call it being underwater when you're below sea level or when you're below ground level. And you would start 24 below. Yeah, so way down here. Sorry, my head is in the way. How important is that? It's probably not that important. So you would start at negative 24 below the ground level, and then you're launching your product. That's what we often call it. They call it a product launch. And we're measuring the profit from the sale of this product using this model. And it looks a lot like throwing the pumpkin off the top of the cliff, except for Instead of being at the top of the cliff, when you're um, calculating profit, you always start in the negative. Yeah, that's the, that's the trouble with a lot of business applications, um, especially profit business applications. You start off in the hole, right? You start off in the negative. And then you are launching the product up, and your goal is to find this is the optimal uh, profit. And so we want to stop right here. Right at the optimal profit before our profits start to turn around and go the other way. Yeah, get out while you can. Yeah. Also known as take the money and run. Okay. So that is the um, connection between the pumpkin and the profits, the pumpkin and the profits. All right, well, while you've been um, watching me do all that, let's get back to the calculus here. So we have our P prime of X. Here, let me just write P again, because I feel like I'm gonna erase that and I don't wanna. I, I, I want to be able to erase it without screwing anything up. So now I can erase all that. Okay, so there's my profit function. We take the derivative. We set it equal to zero. So many of these steps are very repetitive, right? You've seen this a lot. So I'm subtracting 13, dividing by negative 0.04, 13. The negatives are going to cancel. Divided by 0 0.04, 325. All right, so that's how many widgets All right, so if we sell um, 325 widgets, now, technically, you have to produce them as well. So I, I forgot to mention that, but I think that that's clear. You can't sell something that hasn't been first produced. Um, when, when we talk about profit, again, that's one of the reasons why the diagram looks the way it does. You're producing these widgets at a cost, which is sort of baked into this formula here. Um, and if you don't sell any of the widgets, they call that eating the cost. And that's why you end up losing money right off the start. Yeah. Now, I don't know how we're measuring this. I do know we're measuring this in dollars, but I don't know, you know, this problem doesn't uh, include any additional information about the production of these widgets. So that it's just $24. I don't know if that's, you know, every day, every week. We don't, we don't have any of that information in this example, but maybe some future examples will We'll give more clarity to that. So the max profit is original function 
Sell 325 of these widgets. And calculate the result. Okay. So we got 325. We're going to square it. Gives us 105,625 multiplied by negative 0 0.02. So that's negative 2112.5. Uh, 325 times 13, 4225, and then minus 24. I like to look at the first two terms and look for that pattern. It should come out to just be positive 2112.5. All right, let's see. All right, if it doesn't, then I did something wrong. So 4225 and then negative 2112.5, negative 2112.5, ta-da, exactly as I predicted, which is why I always wait to do the constant term, which is negative 24. So now I'm going to subtract $24, not too shabby. You know, it's like my original losses. Uh, one way to think about it is, you know, you took a loan for $24. And if you really want to think about it, you took a loan for $24 that, you know, you start off in the hole. All right. Now, again, I don't know all the details of what we're producing. There, there could be more to it, but this is just a very general way of thinking about it. You started off owing $24, then you launched your product. Right, you launch your product and then you get to the maximum or the optimal profit and that is obtained by selling 325 widgets to produce, uh, produced and sold to generate um, a profit of $2,088.50. Uh, sometimes I like to write it like money. So it looks like 50 cents, but you could also just say 0.5. So there you go. The law of gravity is essentially the same as the law of profit in terms of a mathematical model, of course. Well, um, we're going to kind of, or I'm going to go through each of the different um, concepts that we've uh, seen in this course. So we'll, I started with profit because it's like directly related to the, the, the topic, but then we'll kind of back up and go through um, piecewise here. Um, so the next thing would be revenue. Um, remember what revenue is very similar to profit, but without the cost. So revenue is just how much money are you bringing in as if you didn't have to um, spend any money. That's a one-sided view of, of business is just looking at the revenue. So uh, it usually starts with a price demand function. So I'll say the price demand for an imported um, fabric from a land far away is given by P of X. Negative point zero five x plus one forty, where p of x is the price in dollars when x um, yards of this fabric are demanded. Right. 
Um, I just said fabric. It, it could be silk. It could be cotton. It could be polyester. It, um, just some kind of a fabric that's being imported. And then we're going to sell it here in the United States, assuming because we're our pricing it is in dollars. Um, and then the demand is X. How many yards of this fabric are the consumers demanding? All right. And again, we use the word demanding very loosely. Yeah, we don't mean they're out there demanding this product. We mean that as we're selling it, there's a demand for it. If the demand goes down, then the price is going to go up. Yeah. And vice versa. As the demand goes up, the price goes down. Typically, these are related um, in a in a linear fashion, typically, although we have seen some more exotic examples. Um, this is the most common type. All right. So again, let's go ahead and optimize the revenue. All right. So again, uh, find X number of units. And find the max revenue. That's the optimal optimization. Well, um, you got to be careful with P's. Remember P, this is a lowercase P. Sometimes I'll do things like I'll make it look a little fancy, give it a little curve or something, just so that it doesn't look like profit. Um, some um, techniques, some textbooks, and some lectures you might see if you're out there, you know, surfing the, the internet for other presentations besides mine. Um, you might see that uh, some professors use different um, symbols besides P. I just got used to it and I still use it. So, uh, so revenue, remember, revenue is the price times the number of units. There, I'll just annotate that very quickly. So price times units, the number of units. You probably noticed this before when we were doing the price demand functions that you just end up with the same type of, or the same you know, character in the function, but it changes its type from a linear function. This is linear line. And this then becomes quadratic when you distribute the X the revenue function is quadratic. I actually considered doing this one first, uh, but I rethought it before I did it um, because uh, this is very similar. Oops. Now it's very similar when you multiply it by X to the pumpkin chunk because there's no constant term, right? So you can think of revenue as starting from the ground level going up, being launched, and then coming back to the ground level like that. Okay, it's very much like Oklahoma on the prairie starting on the ground level and launching up. Now, so what's our goal? Optimization, so we wanna find this point right here. Okay, that's where the tangent line is horizontal. Yeah, so that's the reason why we're using calculus and taking the derivative. And, you know, we've been preparing for this for many weeks now. And you have all the skills that you need to do it. So we have our revenue function. Then we take the derivative of the revenue function. So two times negative uh, 0 0.05. I always think of that as money. So that's like a nickel. Yeah. It's negative a nickel. Yeah. And then you multiply it by two and now you have negative 10 cents. Right. Which you could also write as just negative 0 0.1. But I like to see the 10 there. And then we're going to set this equal to zero. and solve for X. And 
and that will give us the number of yards of fabric that we should sell. And it's interesting to think about why you have to stop. You know, while you're doing these calculations, I really didn't need the calculator for that, but I really just wanted to make sure I got my zeros right. So this is the number of yards of fabric that I should sell. And you think, well, why would you stop? Why stop at this point right here? What, what causes it to turn around? And again, it's a little bit out of the realm of, of mathematics, pure mathematics. It's more in the realm of social science and economics and the behavior of people, right? After this point, the market would get flooded and the price would go down and you'd end up losing revenue, right? And that's, that's again, for those of you that are, you know, business majors and taking more, um, you know, specialized courses in human behavior and how humans react to supply and demand, um, this is the sweet spot, right? This is what you're aiming for, right? If you go, you go too much of this fabric in the market would then cause the price to go down and then you would lose revenue. So this is where you want to stop. That's your optimal solution. And that's the most preferred um, number that we're looking for. So 1,400 yards of fabric, and now we want the max revenue. So we're going to plug in 1,400, again, into the original revenue function. And that's going to tell us the final answer. So we got 1,400. I already have it in my calculator. And then I'm going to square it. Gives me 1,960,000 times 0 0.05 negative. Let's see if this pattern holds up. Uh, so we got 140 times 1,400, 196,000. Does the pattern hold up? Again, there is no constant term because we're starting on the ground level. We're starting at zero, essentially. It's just launching like this. So you have 196,000 minus 98,000. If the pattern holds up, it's just a confirmation that I did it right. Yep. You just get positive 98,000 here. And those are dollars, right? I wanna make it very clear that the units are different. This is how much, it's the quantity, 100, uh, 1,400 yards of fabric or 1,400 units. If you can think of these as the units, right? We're measuring the fabric in yards. Um, and then these are dollars. Right? Sometimes we put a dollar sign and sometimes we just put the word. $98,000, that would be our max. Okay, so that is your optimization of revenue. Uh, a neat little fun fact um, is that the price per yard is very easy. Just take the revenue, 98,000, and divide it by the number of yards. So I'm just gonna say, fun fact, if you're curious, right? Or maybe I'll ask, who knows? Maybe it'll be extra credit, I don't know. Or maybe it won't, I don't know. I just want you to know, I want you to be curious. If you made $98,000 in revenue by selling 1,400 yards of fabric, quick you know, calculation, just quick arithmetic, this isn't even calculus, this is just arithmetic, Divide those, and it's telling you $70 per yard. $70 per yard. So that's pretty expensive. I don't, I don't go to the fabric store. Does anybody you know, go to the fabric store and buy fabric? You know, Michaels or one of these other fabric stores? Um, where you could buy large, you know, spools of fabric. Seventy dollars a yard seems expensive to me, but I don't know. It's not my, it's not my speciality. All right. 
it is imported, right? So maybe $70 a, a yard makes sense. Okay, well. The uh, honeymoon is over. Have I used that term before in this course? I use it in a lot of my courses. Um, the honeymoon is the sweet time, if you can call it that, if there is a, a sweet time in a math lecture where all of the equations are given to you. All right. At this point, I'm going to transition to pure word problems or story problems, or apps, if you want to call them that. In other words, problems in which you have to figure everything out. So example four. Uh, an online um, electronics dealer sells laptop computers. for $390 each. A market survey indicates that for each $15 rebate, Offered at the checkout, um, offered. The number of laptops sold will increase by a hundred and fifty per month. The wholesale cost of each computer is $130, and monthly fixed costs are negligible. It's an online store. So I don't have to pay my employees. I'm assuming I'm doing it myself. I don't have any bills to pay. Or if I do, those costs are so low, we call it negligible. So negligible means so close to zero that we ignore it. Yeah, we do that a lot, right? You say, well, that's a negligible cost. I'll just assume it's zero. It might actually have a cost, but we're going to ignore it. Okay. Well, optimize this, yeah? Find the optimal rebate. And what is the maximum profit, monthly profit. So now we have a time frame. All of these costs and all of these sales units are fixed to a particular month. Um, now, that's all often put in these problems. You know, when they get more detail, we say daily or weekly or monthly or annually. Um, but you really don't use that in solving it. It's just a frame of mind so that you realize that there's there's a start and an end to this problem, um, and you know it doesn't. It's not like this goes on forever and ever and ever. Okay, which makes you feel a little bit more you know uh, assured that these numbers are not you know forever values. They're just everything is temporary for that particular period of time. Okay, well, um, how do we dissect this? So we got to dissect this into pieces. So let's um, dig into it a little bit. So first, we're going to look for the price demand. Oh, shoot. 
I, I left off one number. An electronics dealer has sells laptop computers for three hundred. I forgot to tell you how many they sell. So put in a little thing here. They sell eleven hundred and fifty laptops uh, each month. I forgot to write that part down. I don't know how I lost that. But. So, well, as I'm dissecting it, I realized that I just forgot. I wrote the word laptop and I forgot to say how many laptops. So they're selling 1,150 laptop computers for $390 each every month. Yeah. The survey indicates, I erased the word survey. Uh, the surveys, I think one of those little online pop-up surveys, that for every $15 that they would um, take off of the price, the number of laptops would increase by 150 per month. Okay. Um, so let's do that first. So first find the price demand. So step one, find the price demand. And then step two, find the cost function. That's actually the easier step. So if you wanted to reverse the order, you certainly could. You could find the cost function first. I like to do the harder thing first and then the easy thing last. Um, but again, I'll leave it to you to decide. And I got to give myself some workspace here. So find the price demand function. I like to use the old fashioned Y equals MX plus B formula. It's just the equation of a line. Okay. M is the rate. The rate of change. Yeah, it's based on the rebate. So for every $15 rebate, so that's negative $15, right? Remember, a rebate is the same as a decrease in price. So if I decrease the price by $15, then I will increase the demand. by 150 per month, 150 per month. So for every $15 that I take off the price, I increase the sales or I increase the demand by 150 units or 150 laptops. So that's my slope. Yeah, that's your M. I really don't need a calculator for this. It's negative 15 divided by 150. That's going to be negative 0.1. So there's my M. Okay. Pretty straightforward, right? We've, we've done that before. Um, and then now we're going to use this. 1,150 laptops at $390 to find B. Use a given price and quantity. Um, so price is Y equals uh, 390. And quantity is X equals 1150. Shh. I forgot to put the dog away. So we've got Y equals negative 0.1 X plus B. 
We have a given price and a given quantity. So the price is going to be 390. Got to put them in the right spot. The quantity is 1150. We use those to figure out what B is. I will use, actually, I don't need a calculator for that either. 390, negative 0.1 times 1150 is negative 115. I could have done that on a calculator, but I'm trying to just save a little bit of time. And then I add 115 to both sides. And that's going to give me 390 plus 115. Uh, what's that? 505? I don't trust my mental math at this point, so let's do it. 390 plus 115. And I'm going to feel stupid when I do it, but yep. 505. Okay, so we got it. Price demand function. So therefore, price demand is given by, and all we do is write it using function notation. So PX, which is the same as Y. All right, you could just keep it as Y if you really wanted. Negative 0.1x plus 505. So that's how much work you have to do when the honeymoon is over. Right? When I don't start the problem by telling you the price demand equation. Right? But I do have to give you all of the tools to do it. So. All right. So that's uh, price demand. And then now let's do costs. So next cost, it said the wholesale cost is $130 per laptop uh, and fixed costs are negligible. Cost is AX plus B. Or MX plus B, same thing. Uh, it's a different B. Sometimes I write it this way, just so that it's clearly different. So wholesale cost is A, fixed cost is B, which is negligible, which is zero. So our cost function is $130 per laptop plus zero. So you don't put the plus zero, we just say 130X. All right, so there you go. Now you've got all of the information that you need to find the profit. So profit is revenue minus cost. Oh, I forgot to tell you what revenue is, but you already know it. We just did it a few minutes ago. So let me just squeeze it in up here. Revenue is the same as price demand, same template of price demand multiplied by X. So you just increase the, the degree by multiplying everything by X and you get the revenue function. So for all practical purposes, when I tell you price demand or when you find price demand, you are also finding revenue. All right, so we got our profit function. It's going to be revenue minus cost. So this is cost, 130x. And usually we combine this a little bit to make the final equation as simplified as possible. You see how confusing this is with uh, price and profit? Sometimes we'll just put a little. Just to remind us. Oh, and then revenue. Okay. And then cost is already baked into the formula here. 
So 505 is what you're um, selling them for, minus 130 is what you are uh, spending wholesale on each computer. 505 minus 130. Okay, so that's your um, price per unit or profit per unit, uh, $375. Because you're you know obviously selling them for more than you're buying them for wholesale. All right, so that's it. All of that work creates your profit function. Now optimize. That's the easy part. Right? The optimization is actually the easiest part. So take the derivative. Set it equal to zero. Solve for x. So 375 divided by 0.2. 1875, what were these again? Units, right? Computers, laptops. So we need to um, uh, produce, or in this case, you know, you're, you're not really manufacturing them, you're just buying them wholesale and then selling them online for a profit, right? That's how they make a quick buck. It's also called flipping, yeah? You know that. You buy something low, you flip it, you sell it for higher online, and you make a profit. So you're going to sell 1,875 of these laptops. Now plug these number, this number of laptops in for X and find your max profit. And it might be a little counterintuitive how you could end up losing you know, money by selling too many. But, you know, the internet is a strange place. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe, but those, you know, it's human behavior that drives the internet. Your generation is probably much more, um, you know, tuned into that behavior than, than in my generation. But, you know, the markets get flooded, the saturation point and, and perhaps you'll end up buying all these laptops and then, you know, you buy them wholesale and, and then nobody buys them and they're stuck in your garage somewhere. And, and then there's a new laptop that comes out every six months or every year. Right. And so this is the sweet spot. This is a way of sort of planning it out so that you don't end up, you know, holding the bag at the end of the day. So you got 1875. Of course, these are just models. None of this is perfect, but the models give us an idea of what's going to happen. It's a, it's a predictor of, of reality, just like with throwing the pumpkin, you know? I mean, even the pumpkin problem wasn't perfect. You know, lots of things can happen. There's lots of other things that could happen. The wind could have blown the pumpkin an extra couple of feet, right? There's, there's other factors, the air pressure, um, I'm not going to go on with all the other possibilities, but you know, you know, the old cliche stuff happens. Not everything goes according to plan. So 1875 times 375. Oh, I forgot one of my terms. Oh yeah. There's no, no fixed cost. I, I was thinking that there was a missing term here for a second. Because usually the profit function has um, a last term. That's the negligible. That's that negligible um, fixed cost. If you're wondering why this doesn't look like a typical profit function. Uh, usually it's minus, by the way. Um, because it's zero, we're negating it. We're saying that this number is so close to zero that we don't care about it. Um, so you're going to get 703, 125. 
Let's see if that pattern holds up. 703.125 minus 351.562.5. Yep, that pattern still holds up. 351, 562, and 50 cents. Not too bad. That's three hundred fifty-one thousand dollars. Five hundred sixty-two and fifty cents. Three five one five six two fifty. Sometimes putting a comma here helps you read it. I usually don't do that because the computer sometimes gets confused when you type commas. You do need to type the decimal point. Um, you could also just put point five. That would be fine as well. But I like to make it look like money. Not too shabby, yeah. Um, now, I don't know. Um, the, the fixed cost being negligible is, you know, assuming you have a very big garage. <laughs> you got you to gotta store 800 and, 1,875 laptops. And remember, this was in one month. So you have a lot of work to do. So your time, your labor, your energy is part of that cost. And we're negating it in this example. So it's not entirely a perfect model, but, you know, you're willing to work for free. You're not, you know, if you're only paying yourself, that's not too shabby. Right? If you're a one-person business or even just a small business with a couple employees, that's $351,562.50 per month. So that, that, that's pretty good. Yeah, not bad. Not too shabby. All right. Well, you know, that's, that's business. What else could happen? Um, revenue. Uh, revenue is kind of in here. It's baked into the formula here. But um, let's talk about... Um, the human aspect of revenue. And in, in this example, the human aspect is always, all of these problems have the human aspect of the demand, right? You know, what are people gonna want? You know, what are they willing to pay for something, right? Um, but what about um, attending something? What about where the human value is simply showing up to a, a concert or something like that? So suppose a concert venue uh, holds, it's pretty big, you know, it's not as big as, you know, Coachella or something, uh, 62,000 people. So it's a big, you know, arena or something, maybe like the Acrisher Arena arena, or, you know, some kind of a big stadium or something. Okay. Uh, when the ticket price These are cheap tickets. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Is $10. All right, so this would have been like going to a concert in the 80s or something. Um, you could have, you could, there, there were concerts in the 80s. I went to some where the tickets were only $10. Like I went to a $5 concert once in Los Angeles and it was at a big, you know, the forum where they, where they, you know, hold the, the bat, where they used to hold basketball games. Anyway, um, so I'm dating myself here, but I guess I forgot to update this problem for the 21st century. Um, I'm not going to raise the ticket price on you now. Uh, the average attendance has been uh, 2,500, 25,000 uh, people per show. Okay. Uh, when the price dropped to eight bucks, Attendance rose to 31,000. Uh, find the 
optimal ticket price. And then what is the maximum revenue? Now this is just a revenue problem. It's a concert venue. Obviously there's gonna be costs. In fact, you gotta pay the bands to play. You gotta pay all the employees that work at the concert. We're negating all of that. We're just saying revenue, solely revenue for a concert. All right, so it's sort of like ignoring half of the problem, but that's okay. If you can maximize the revenue, that puts you in a good position, and then you can better analyze those other things later. It turns out that those things are a little bit easier to analyze. So let's just focus on revenue. All right. So again, much like the last problem, we're going to start with um, by finding the price demand. All right. And again, you can use P, but I just like Y equals MX plus B. Very straightforward. It's classic. Um, you actually ignore this number here. All right. You don't care about how many people fit in the concert venue, but you can check later to see if um, you exceeded uh, capacity. So this is basically saying that you can't sell more than 62,000 tickets, right? So if you get an answer that's more than 62,000 tickets, remember X is the number of tickets. That's kind of cool. We, we usually abbreviate or a uh, slang way to write tickets is ticks, T-I-X. That's kind of easy to remember. So X is the number of tickets. So you do not want to exceed the number of tickets must be less than or equal to 62,000. But don't actually put 62,000 into your equation. It's just sort of a upper bound. It's, it's an absolute extreme. You cannot go past that many. I guess you could say the domain, if you really wanted to put it into your problem. I'll put it in a bubble. The domain is from zero to 62,000. So you're, you're sort of boxed in there. All right, so enough about that. Let's get on to the problem. When the ticket price is $10, the average attendance was 25,000. So we're gonna call this um, Y1, right? This is price. Y is the price. X is the tickets, right? It's the number of tickets. That's supposed to be a pound sign or a number sign. You guys call it a hashtag these days. So Y1 is $10. X1 is $25,000. let us write that down over here. Y1 is 10. X1 is 25000 when the ticket price dropped to $8, that's Y2, attendance rose to 31,000, 31,000. All right, so my slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So my slope is 8 minus 10, plugging in these numbers here, 
8 minus 10 over 31,000 minus 25,000. Negative 2 over 6,000. I'm going to double check. I'm pretty sure I'm right, but I have screwed these up before, especially this late in the, in the video. Uh, the top is clearly negative 2. The bottom is 6,000. Um, 2 divided by 6,000. I'm going to leave it as a fraction because look at the decimal. Ugh. So I'm going to leave it as 1 over 3,000. Normally, I would put it as a decimal if it was a nice decimal. But when this type of thing happens, I usually leave as a fraction. Otherwise, your answer will be slightly off, and we don't want that to happen. Okay, so that's our slope. All right, now we got to find the B. Let's find the B. So we got Y equals negative 1 over 3,000 times X plus B. Just pick one of these pairs to plug it in. Doesn't really matter. Uh, let's go with this one. Pick one, pick a pair, pick a pair. All right, so I'm not picking that one, I'm picking that one. So I've got a uh, 10 equals negative one over 3,000 times 25,000 plus B. So 10 equals negative 25,000 over 3,000 plus B. Oh. So I've got um, 10 equals negative 8.33333 plus B, so that'll be 18.33333 equals B. I'm just going to add point or 8.33333 to both sides. So that's uh, B is 18 and one third. Which kind of sucks, but I'm not changing the problem now. So sometimes that happens. I don't know if it'll happen to you or not. Hopefully you'll get a much nicer set of numbers. I just randomly pick the numbers. So hopefully you'll get a nice terminating decimal. If not, just deal with it. It's fine. It's life. Okay. Um, so what does that tell us now? We've got the slope and we've got the um, B. So we've got the price demand function. So the slope is M and the B is the B. It's the y-intercept or the price demand intercept. If you really wanted to be safe, um, B is uh, 18 and one third. You remember that old trick from arithmetic? Three times 18 plus one. 55 thirds. That would be the safe way to write the B. So I've got my price demand is negative 1 over 3,000 X plus 55 thirds. That's my price demand. Or you could also write it as a decimal. Although the decimal would be very, very difficult to read. One over 3,000 is, or negative one over 3,000 is, you know, that, that's terrible. 
and then 55 divided by 3 is 18.3333. These mean the same thing, but I actually prefer this one, right? Fractions are much safer um, than repeating decimals. Now remember, we're looking for the optimal price, right? We're looking for the optimal price. So what we can do is we can rewrite this Without using a function notation, just rewrite it using the letter P. Multiply everybody by 3,000. You get 3,000 P equals negative 1X plus 55,000, right? See, these 3,000s will cancel. This three will go into the 3,000 1,000 times, and then solve for X. And you're gonna go, what? Are you doing, Dr. J? You're driving me crazy. Well, you'll see the madness in a minute. The question is not asking for X, it's asking for P. It's asking for the price, right? The optimal price. So P is going to act like our X, right? And X is going to act like our Y. And we're going to think about the function as being a function of P. Divide everybody by negative one. And you get a function of price. So this is demand as a function of price. It's still the price demand function. It's just rearranged so that the X is on the left-hand side and the P is on the right-hand side and now this equation will automatically give you your result as a function of the price, okay? I should still make sure that I don't sell too many tickets, right? Because I, So I have, to, I have to make sure that X doesn't go above, what was it, uh, 62,000 people that fit in the stadium. But I mean, that's an afterthought. I can, I can do that later, right? I'm willing to sell as many tickets as I can to, depending on the price, right? So the price is really what I'm looking for. All right. Remember, revenue now will be a function of P. Okay. So R of P is X times P. X is negative 3,000 P. plus 55,000 times an additional P. All right, revenue is just the number of units times the price. Normally in these types of problems, the variable was X, but now the variable is P, but it's still the same concept. The function looks very similar. It's still a quadratic function but instead of the variable being 
x, the variable is p now. It's the price. So there you go. That is your revenue function. Now, optimize. Optimize. Find the optimal solution. So we take the first derivative. Yeah. Two times negative 3,000 is negative 6,000. And then 55,000, set this equal to zero. And solve. Now this is price, so we can have decimal points. Uh, with the X's, you really couldn't because X, X represents a number of people. Um, you can't have a half a person in a seat. Uh, but this, this can be divided um, into hundredths. So 9.166666. So we'll round to $9.17. That's our optimal price. $9.17. Uh, sometimes I write it like this. Optimal price per ticket is $9.17. Okay, and then the max revenue is plug in $9.17 everywhere there's a P. Uh, now you could argue, well, when you round, you're a little bit past that point, right? Because remember, this point is like this. It's a little dot here. And we rounded, so we're just a little bit past that sweet spot. But you either have to go to the right of the sweet spot, or you can go to the left of the sweet spot. So this would be $9.16, and this would have been $9.17. I mean, if you want to be a nice, you know, business owner, you could do the lower price, 916. It's not going to change the answer. Right? Those, those points will essentially give you the same revenue. I'm just using the classic rules of rounding, so, which is typically what the computer does. You can even not round it if you wanted and just leave it like that. I do have a tolerance for what I'll accept. It just has to be close. So $9.17 squared, and then times uh, 3,000, negative 3,000. So negative 252,266.7. And let's see if that sweet, if that uh, pattern holds up, right? The revenue pattern, let's see, $9.17 times 55,504,350, and then subtract 252, 266.7. Ah, it's off a little bit. That's because of the rounding error. So had we not rounded, the, the pattern would have held up, but it's close enough. And again, that's dollars. That's your maximum revenue. All right, $252,000 in revenue for selling tickets at $9 a ticket. Right. Now, of course, this has not been adjusted for inflation. The current ticket value would probably be more like, you know, $99, or I don't know what your kids are paying for concert tickets these days. Um, and then to check your answer, so that is the final answer. The optimal price is 917, and the uh, 
optimal revenue. And again, you could write it this way as well with a dollar sign. I think that's what I do in this particular problem. I like to see that it looks like money. Both of these are money, yeah. Now you could check uh, the capacity, which is the number of tickets. Um, remember, you can't sell more than 62,000 tickets. So this is just checking your answer, right? Um, you just simply take the revenue, I already have it on my calculator, and divide by the price. That makes sense, right? If you're selling tickets for $9.17 each, which assumes that every ticket in the house is the same price, that's also not reasonable, right? You have different layer levels of, of how close you are to the, to the event or whatever. And you just divide these two and you get 27,490 tickets sold, which is not too bad. It's below the capacity, which is 62,000, right? It's actually only half full, which drives me crazy. You know, when I, when I do the math and I get an answer that I was like, well, really? I'm gonna get the maximum revenue by only having a half full show? I mean, the band isn't gonna be very happy with that. So what we maybe can do is adjust some of the variables to and this might be a question for a later date. I don't know if we're, we definitely don't have time today. This, this, this lecture is over. Um, but, you know, sometime we might come back to this type of a problem and try to, you know, patch the holes, so to speak. You know, I, I think I did um, at least mention it once where we want to fill every seat in the house, right? And, and see what that model looks like. Uh, we don't have time for that today. Um, so I've, I've done all I can for this video. So. Um, until we meet again, I'm Dr. Jordan, and I'll see you on the internet.